So let's see a small animation on some of the enzymes and techniques which are used in the recombinant DNA technology or molecular cloning. Here I would like to display how a restriction endonucleases introduces a cut in the DNA fragment. If you can see the restriction endonucleases, these are enzymes which cleave the DNA at very specific nucleotide sequences. The sequence recognized is always 4 to 6 nucleotides long. For example, the restriction endonuclease ECO R1 as shown here recognizes the sequence GAATTC. These nucleotides at, are recognized at one end and are often complementary to those at the other end. The two strands of the DNA duplex, they have the same nucleotide sequences which are running in opposite directions for the length of the recognition sequence. Means these are inverted repeats. As the same recognition sequence occurs in both of the DNA strands, the restriction endonuclease can bind to and cleave both the DNA strands at that specific point between A and G. As the bond cleaved is typically not positioned in the center, it is on the either line of the symmetry. As you can see, these DNA strands being anti-parallel to each other, there is a cohesive end cut. After cleavage, the DNA fragment, it has a single stranded end and few nucleotides. Now, this is what is called as a cohesive end or a sticky end. These single stranded ends can now pair with each other, even with the insert or they themselves can be paired with the enzyme DNA ligase. You can imagine if the same restriction endonuclease is used to cut some uh, another gene or the gene of interest let us say as shown in the pink color here from two different sources but the same restriction endonuclease is being used as it the cut is always between G and A you can understand that the phosphodiester bond by ligase is very simple as uh, compared to the DNA sequences which are introduced from another source. So this is how restriction endonucleases are uh, functioning and uh, these are very important tools in the molecular cloning or recombinant DNA technology or genetic engineering. Now the same uh, animation I would like to show in a much more molecular fashion that is at the level of molecular biology how may it uh, be like means it's all liquid you see. So in this animation you can see that the tools are you have as I say a micro pipette you, the enzymes are present in a small micro pipettes which you have to take it from the ependroff tubes now these are the plasmids now inside the solution the plasmid when you add enzymes restriction endonucleases these are small biomolecules uh, which you can see these small dots in the animation here these are restriction enzymes which will now act on the plasmids they will introduce a cut and you see this is some much more uh, closer view let us say how these restriction enzyme it binds to the DNA and functions on it recognizes that specific sequence that 4 to 6 uh, nucleotide base sequence and it generates a sticky end somewhere in another test tube you do the same for the gene of interest to use the same enzyme and this red DNA it is a gene of interest now we add this in the tube which is containing the plasmids you introduce this red DNA now you see adding these green molecules these are ligase the ligase and the cut fragment now there are two possibilities here you have to understand that either this gene of interest will be introduced into the plasmid by ligation reaction as the ligase is functioning here and you may have a plasmid which has self annealed means there is no insert there can be one plasmid with an insert and another pl plasmid without interest so you can see here this this is what I was trying to tell show there are two types of plasmids here as you can see this is a plasmid which has got the gene of interest and this is a plasmid which went blank means there was a cut there was a chance of the gene of interest getting introduced but what happened here was it self annealed now in some of the aspects of my previous lecture I had explained certain enzymes which do not allow these vectors to self anneal. Okay, anyway this probability is there and this plasmid, this 1, 2, 3, 4, these plasmids which is uh, high in number is a recombinant plasmid and these are non-recombinant plasmids. 
Now while introducing these plasmids into a host, we have to take into consideration the multiplication of the cells. Post multiplication it is important that you have some methodology to detect whether this plasmid has got inserted or not. So this is how the molecular cloning or the recombinant DNA technology uh, experiments takes place. So you have two types of inserts here, one insert, second insert. Here what is the difference between one insert and two inserts? So you see interestingly here only one gene of interest is introduced whereas here the gene of interest has end to end ligated and double gene of interest have been inserted here. So that is also a probability. N number of probabilities are there when recombinant DNA technology is being carried out. Molecular cloning is being carried out. To avoid this we have an array of enzymes which we call it as the DNA modifying enzymes. In my next animation I would like to show you a somewhat molecular detail of DNA ligase. Come let's see that. DNA ligation is the formation of a covalent bond between adjacent DNA fragments, frequently a vector and a gene of interest. Ligation is usually the final step before transformation in the cloning workflow. DNA ligase may be used to join double-stranded DNA fragments with either blunt or cohesive ends to form recombinant DNA plasmids. A DNA ligase catalyzes the formation of a phosphodiester bond between juxtaposed 5' phosphate and 3' hydroxyl termini in duplex DNA. Ligation proceeds in three steps. Initially, the ligase is self-adenylated by reaction with free ATP or NAD. Next, the adenyl group is transferred to the 5' phosphorylated end of the donor strand. Lastly, the formation of the phosphodiester bond proceeds through the reaction of the adenylated donor end with the adjacent 3' hydroxyl acceptor, accompanied by the release of AMP. While T4 DNA ligase is the most commonly used ligase for cloning, Additional cloning evolved from the discoveries of site-specific nucleases and DNA ligases in the 1970s to enable the era of molecular cloning. At the beginning, cloning a gene into a plasmid allowed the host organism to replicate the cloned sequence, and this procedure fueled the early gene sequencing, protein expression, and gene function studies. The first step is to identify unique restriction sites in your source DNA that can be used to isolate the fragment of interest. In many cases, PCR can be used to add the necessary restriction sites to the gene of interest to facilitate directional cloning. Digest your vector and DNA fragment of interest with a single restriction enzyme for non-directional cloning or a pair of restriction enzymes possessing different cleavage sites for directional cloning. Use of two different enzymes that produce blunt ends creates a non-directional cloning strategy. If you are using a single restriction enzyme or two enzymes that produce blunt ends, additional screening may be required. To avoid the possibility of vector self-ligation in the ligation step, it is common practice to dephosphorylate the vector to remove the 5' phosphate group that the DNA ligase needs for phosphodiester bond formation. Depending on how you generate your vector and insert, other end treatments may be required. These include blunting, atailing, and phosphorylation. Select a ligase to covalently join the vector and insert. Transform the recombinant plasmid into competent E. coli. Spread onto agar plates that contain the appropriate antibiotic for selection. Screen the resulting colonies for the gene or fragment of interest. Although the basic workflow in traditional cloning has not changed much since the 1970s, the introduction of faster and much more robust enzyme and buffer combinations
as well as wider specificities in the last decade, has made this approach easier and faster than ever before.